uh, I was born in the birth cohorts in the Netherlands where 100,000 kids died of starvation. Mm -hmm. I was a very ill child. And then my uh, early memories are of all these relatives who had these strange reactions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have four siblings and none of them give a damn about what I'm studying. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, these are all nice stories to tell, but they don't explain anything. You just stumbled across it. And I, what happened to me is that when I started to work at the VA, I got really fascinated by how people get stuck in the past, who before were very competent people, everybody you know is looking forward to the future yeah. and what's happening now, and meeting these very competent, smart people and say, they keep replaying the past and cannot come into the present. Hey there, have you ever wondered why some people seem to struggle more than others after experiencing trauma? Well, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk has some fascinating insights on PTSD and trauma that might just blow your mind. From the way our brains process memories to the impact of childhood experiences, Dr. van der Kolk dives deep into the science behind trauma. Get ready to have your perspective shifted and your curiosity peaked. Keep watching and don't forget to subscribe to get notified whenever we publish new video for your mental fitness at Inside Serene. Welcome, Dr. Vessel van der Kolk. Dr. van der Kolk is a professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine. He has well over 100 peer-reviewed papers on psychological trauma and directs the nonprofit Trauma Center in Boston. His most recent book is the best-selling The Body Keeps the Score, Mind, Brain, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. It's terrific to have you here today. Hello. Thank you. Welcome. Good. Your name is often linked with pioneering work in PTSD, and in fact, you start your new book with a moment from the Tuesday after the 4th of July in 1978 with a story about the Vietnam Marine veteran named Tom. And as I sort of wanted to ask, how and when and why did you start studying trauma and why PTSD? You know, questions like this always lead to rationalizations. Mm -hmm because we basically are attracted to whatever our brain attracts us to. <laughs> and then we try to rationalize it afterwards. Uh, you know, a good story is that I, mm -hmm. my father was in a concentration camp. Uh, I was born in the birth cohorts in the Netherlands where 100,000 kids died of starvation. Mm -hmm. I was a very ill child. And then my uh, early memories are of all these relatives who had these strange reactions. Uh -huh. But, you know, I have four siblings and none of them give a damn about what I'm studying. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> these are all nice stories to tell, but they don't explain anything. You just stumbled across it. And I, what happened to me is that when I started to work at the VA, I got really fascinated by how people get stuck in the past who before were very competent people, everybody you know is looking forward to the future yeah. and what's happening now, and meeting these very competent, smart people and say, they keep replaying the past and cannot come into the present. Yeah. And that fascinated me. And part of my fascination is that, you know, the world, neuro, the world neuroscience didn't exist yet mm -hmm. uh, at that time, but. I've always been a student of the brain. Right. I did the first neuroimaging studies on PTSD, and I'm into poetry and art mm -hmm. and complex psychological theories. And this is the place where I could combine my interest in between science and culture. And that's one of the things I think is so fascinating about how people react, whether it's a trauma experienced as a child or trauma experienced in a war or a violent situation is that you don't, you can't always see something outward and yet something is clearly going on right. and, and right. it's so hard for people to understand right. that there's something real. Yeah, uh, that you never see what you get. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can come across as a perfectly reasonable human being right. but 
an hour from now, I may have a horrendous temper tantrum in the parking lot with somebody who does something innocuous to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the nature of being traumatized, is that you have an apparently normal self that can get away with a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and then at the core, some emotional issues get very, very hurt and injured and keep coming mm -hmm. back. On the years since you met Tom the Marine, but and you talk about him and how he he has these nightmares, he sort of doesn't want to give up. And See, that really yeah. throws you. Why, why do you want to do See, that? See, that, that opening line just stunned me. So, so, you know, I do what young doctors who don't know anything do. I think, oh, I'll give you a drug to make your nightmares right. go away. And then it turns out, he says, I didn't want to take your drug because I need to be a living memorial to my yeah. friends who died in Vietnam. And I thought, oh my God, this is just, so much more complex. Yeah. This has to do with love and loyalty and connection. And then he told me his father had the same relationship with his friends who died in the Battle of the Bulge in 1944. Mm -hmm. And I go like, so he's, it happened to his dad. His dad was a terrible father to him. And then he wants to escape from all that, show how good he is right. by joining the Marine Corps. And the same damn thing happens to him, that his dead karma yeah. has become more important than life, people. When we experience trauma, our brains can become stuck in the past. This is because the memories of the traumatic event are stored in a different way than normal memories. Instead of being processed and integrated into our overall memory system, traumatic memories can remain isolated and fragmented. This can lead to a constant re-experiencing of the traumatic event, as if it is happening in the present moment. Bessel van der Kolk, a renowned expert in the field of trauma and PTSD, has provided valuable insights into why we get stuck in the past. One of the key reasons is that trauma can disrupt the brain's ability to regulate emotions. When we experience a traumatic event, our brains can become overwhelmed with intense emotions such as fear, anger, and sadness. These emotions can become trapped in our bodies, leading to a state of chronic hyperarousal. Another reason why we get stuck in the past is that trauma can disrupt our sense of self. When we experience trauma, our sense of safety and security can be shattered. This can lead to feelings of helplessness, shame, and guilt. These negative beliefs about ourselves can become deeply ingrained, making it difficult to move forward and create a new sense of identity. Additionally, trauma can impact our relationships with others. When we experience trauma, we may become hypervigilant and distrustful of others. This can lead to social isolation and a lack of support from friends and family. Without a strong support system, it can be difficult to heal from trauma and move forward in life. In order to overcome the effects of trauma and move forward, it is important to engage in trauma-focused therapy. This type of therapy can help individuals process their traumatic memories in a safe and supportive environment. By working through the emotions and beliefs associated with the trauma, individuals can begin to heal and create a new sense of self. Overall, Bessel van der Kolk's insights into why we get stuck in the past highlight the complex nature of trauma and its impact on the brain, emotions, sense of self, and relationships. By understanding these factors, individuals can begin to take steps towards healing and creating a brighter future. By the way, when I did my first book reading, to my astonishment, the second person in line to have his book signed was Tom. No. And he very proudly said, Hi, Dr. Van der Kolk. Half of what you said was true. Half was a complete lie because I never committed atrocities in Vietnam. It's true because I contaminated the story <laughs> of several people. Right. And I had always wondered what happened to him. And he looked fantastic. Wow. So you can reconnect to the present. People say that PTSD is so hard to treat. That's actually not true. What do you mean? Uh, everybody say, oh, PTSD is hard. No, we know how to treat PTSD extremely well, actually. Why don't we? It happens not to have to percolate mm -hmm. in, the, in the VA, which is still doing stuff right. that doesn't work particularly well. But, you know, we know a lot of stuff. Of, I mean, we hear about uh, it a lot again because yeah. of all the 
you know, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, people coming back with sort of invisible injuries. Well, not that invisible, actually. When you go to a family gathering, it's not so invisible mm -hmm. who is traumatized. You know, people are collapsed, people have temper tantrums, people blow up, people are not playing along. No, it's, it's not that invisible. It really comes out quite it clearly does. in behavior. Well, in that, that intervening time, have we learned more? Do we understand why this happens to some people and not others? Or is it still kind of, uh, you, know, you know? people make a big deal out of that. The same thing doesn't happen to two people. You know, if an explosion, mm. there's an explosion here that kills our cameraman, uh, we have different reactions, but you have a different relationship to the cameraman mm -hmm. than I do. Mm -hmm. And so the stuff about some people are more vulnerable than others, it is sort of a way of getting away from the reality is that it can happen to all of us. And indeed, if you have been abandoned as a child, mm -hmm. and you have been abused as a child, you're much more likely to get traumatized by later life events. But the romanticism about resilience is I take it with a grain of salt. These are feel-good stories yeah. to deny how bad it is. Well, sometimes I think in reading, you know, some of your work and some of the sort of discussions about about trauma, it almost seems like it says about as much about society as a whole as about any individual. Like I was particularly struck, yeah. how, you know, 1917 and 1947. I think there were these sort of these almost waves of this stuff's all made up, and that says something I think about how we as a society are reacting almost to something the society has experienced. See, see what, what's interesting for me is that you're living in the denial world. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's connected with wars. Uh -huh. But one out of four people has been traumatized in our society. There is millions of children who are being abandoned and hurt and abused right mm -hmm. now. There is 30 times as many kids who get traumatized than their soldiers. But all the attention goes to soldiers mm -hmm. because they are heroes. Not that it, we shouldn't pay attention right. to them, but our society is rife with trauma. Has it always been? Yeah. But the difference is we now know it and still deliberately ignore it. Talk so the a little knowledge more is about there that. Today. <laughs> the knowledge is there. We know, we know how much trauma there is. It's been very well spelled out. We know what to do about it to a large degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and people put their head in the sand. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the striking things about trauma is that nobody really wants to face it. Mm -hmm. huh? So before the invasion of Iraq, I wrote an editorial and sent it to the New York Times. Right. And I said, you know, it looks like you go to invade a country that had nothing to do with 9-11. That's a choice you right. can make. But if you do that, about half of the people who you send off there, if they live, will come back and become homeless or drug addicts and will be always be unemployed because it has happened after every war. There will be a substantial number of people who will commit atrocities who were previously pretty benign people mm -hmm. because it happens in every war. There will be a large number of people who will become drug addicts and alcoholics right. because that's the primary outcome of sending people off to war. Most marriages of these people will fail mm -hmm. because it will interfere with the capacity for intimacy. But I wrote in the editorial, if you choose to do that knowingly, that's a decision you make. Mm -hmm. But know what you're doing. Right. Of course, the New York Times did not publish my op-ed. <laughs> And everything I said in this thing happened because it happened after Vietnam, it happened after right. Korea, it happened after the Second World War, it happened after the First World War. We know that stuff. So why do we keep doing it? Because we are a self-destructive species. And we think it's really cool to bomb the hell out of people <laughs> who don't look like us. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, a renowned psychiatrist and author, has dedicated his career to studying and treating post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. His approach to healing focuses on the importance of addressing the underlying trauma that has caused the disorder. Vanderkolk believes that traditional talk therapy is not always effective in treating PTSD, as the trauma is often stored in the body and not just the mind. Instead, he advocates for a more holistic approach to healing, incorporating techniques such as yoga, mindfulness, and EMDR therapy. By engaging the body in the healing process, Vanderkolk believes that individuals can begin to release the stored trauma and move towards recovery.
Van der Kolk's approach to healing PTSD has been groundbreaking in the field of psychiatry, as it challenges traditional methods of treatment and offers a more comprehensive and effective way to address trauma. Through his research and clinical work, he has helped countless individuals find relief from their symptoms and regain control of their lives. In conclusion, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk's approach to healing PTSD offers hope to those who have been struggling with the disorder. By addressing the underlying trauma and engaging the body in the healing process, individuals can begin to move towards recovery and find a sense of peace and wholeness once again. Go to the movie theater, uh, what do you see? The movie theaters is alien forces attacking America and some <laughs> nice white guy with blue eyes holding back these alien creatures with machine guns. People buy that stuff. And it's we, crazy. Yeah, it is. Well, and I thought that our work would sort of begin to move the craziness of mankind. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I realized is that we have not made any difference whatsoever. Except on Angela Merkel. Well, I'm going to jump to the word trauma for a second, yeah. okay? You mentioned the New York Times, and a few years ago there was a profile on some of the work you were doing in the, in the Times Magazine, and in there you talk about how you and your colleagues at the Trauma Center were working to redefine what the word trauma means because it had gotten, everything seemed to be labeled one kind of trauma, and you were doing a lot of looking at are there different kinds of trauma right. that happens at different time, and are different right. approaches to that different. Where has that gone, and are we seeing changes in... So, you trauma. know, there's, there's knowledge and then there is policy. Uh, so, you know, we created this diagnosis of PTSD back in 1980 right. in order to remind the VA that war messes people up and you should treat them. That seems like uh, a pretty pretty simple statement, policy. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it just, that's you know. nothing extraordinary. <laughs> but actually, I've never done anything particularly revolutionary, but suddenly it becomes like, oh. <laughs> and so the first note I get after DSM comes out the VA is, it says, it has never been demonstrated that PTSD is relevant to the mission of the Veterans Administration. <laughs> and so I walk into my boss's office and I say, you know, when the institution you work for is more insane than the patient you're supposed to treat, it's really time to get out of there, otherwise you'll go crazy too. Um, and so, the, and then PTSD gets gets codified mm -hmm. and that's the diagnosis and a lot of money goes into right. it and congressional appropriations and laboratories and centers and then we very quickly discover is that this is other vast group of people mm -hmm. uh, millions of people right. who have been abused as kids who have been abandoned as kids who live without fathers whose parents are off to jail mm -hmm. whose parents are drug addicts that are in our society right. center for disease control does a gigantic study, the ACE study, that shows that this is in fact the biggest public health issue in America and that child abuse and neglect is at the end more expensive than cancer or heart disease. Wow. Yeah. So we study what happens to kids who get abandoned and neglected and uh, we see particular brain tracks that are different, mm -hmm. different from adult trauma, we see particular mental effects, mm -hmm. uh, biological effects, and so a group of us who really know about this stuff, put in a proposal for the American Psychiatric Association to create a new di diagnosis that recognizes this called developmental trauma disorder. Oh. And uh, we sent data on 20,000 kids who we have studied, wow. and data from 20, 200,000 kids mm -hmm. from studies around the world. And the APA says, it has never been demonstrated <laughs> that childhood trauma has serious effects on mind or brain development. And it's left out. And you're uh, going like, common sense says, like, like, what? like, what? Yeah. And so we live in a in a screwy world. And so, right now, these kids who, with these backgrounds, mm -hmm. are diagnosed with conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, bipolar wow. disorder. But in fact, these kids' brains are living in a dangerous internal world. What happens to brains when they, well, on the developmental side, what happens? All kind of, all kind of brain functions that have to do with focus and attention mm -hmm. get disturbed. So when you're constantly on alert for danger, 
your brain specializes in detecting danger. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a brain like that, I'll be sitting with you and go like, she seems like a nice lady, but I think she's going to mess with me. And so my, my, oh. d my detector of danger is hyperactive. And the moment you do anything that might be interpreted as being dangerous, I'll go in a panic reaction. I'll become enraged with you. That you don't know what you've done wrong. Right, you think you're just I, doing some innocuous thing. you'll think this guy's a nut. But from his point of view, you just curl your lip up a little bit. That means that you're going to hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so your brain changes. Huh? Or you shut yourself down. Right. Or a very, very important part of the brain, until you're single, it's part of the brain that filters out what's relevant and what's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And when anything goes and you don't know what's relevant anymore, you're continuously distracted by other stuff. That means uh -huh. you cannot study, you cannot focus, mm -hmm. you cannot earn a living for yourself. These are very, very serious consequences that up to now mm -hmm. are not really in our core uh, definitional system right. of trauma. In America, the statistic on veteran soldiers who have been traumatized upon returning home is a sobering reality. Many of these brave men and women have faced unimaginable horrors on the battlefield, only to come back to a society that struggles to understand their experiences. The transition from military life to civilian life can be incredibly challenging, as these soldiers grapple with the physical and emotional scars of war. For some veterans, the trauma they experienced in combat follows them home, manifesting in symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues. The stigma surrounding mental health in the military can make it difficult for these soldiers to seek help, leading to a cycle of suffering in silence. While the reported prevalence of PTSD and related disorders among deployed veterans has varied depending on the assessment method and service era studied, it generally has been reported to be about 10 to 15 percent. The impact of this trauma extends beyond the individual veteran, affecting their families, friends, and communities. Many veterans struggle to reintegrate into society, finding it difficult to hold down a job, maintain relationships, or even leave their homes. The lack of support and resources available to these veterans only exacerbates their struggles, leaving many feeling isolated and alone. As a society, it is our responsibility to support and care for those who have sacrificed so much in service to our country. By raising awareness, providing access to mental health services, and offering a compassionate ear, we can help these veterans heal and find peace after the traumas of war. It's well known, that's what my book is about. Right. Yeah. So what, what do we do? You just do what you do. You collect data and develop treatments and... Um, and you study it and you study it and you, you show it's harmful? No, uh, no, uh, no, I don't just show what is harmful. I'm very much into... If we know what is, how it is harmful, mm -hmm. how, but how do we did it, take, take the piece of information and what sort of treatment do you institute in order to counteract right. that particular thing? Let me give you an example. Uh, I was an advisor for the Truth Commission in South Africa. Mm. At one point, I had a chance to talk with Nelson Mandela yeah. at, uh, at the reception. And I say to Mandela, you know, I understand you were quite a violent man, the head of a terrorist mm -hmm. army before you were to Roman Island, and then you come out and you're this deeply mindful, thoughtful person. What do you attribute it to? And he says, boxing. Huh. I go, like, boxing is a terribly violent sport. He says, no, in boxing, you need to know, really look at what the other person is doing mm -hmm. and assess what he's going to do, anticipate his moves, know where your body is, and how to anticipate what you're doing back. And I go, like, that is brilliant. That's exactly what goes wrong in traumatized people who are always sort of reacting to the wrong thing, and you get your head you block knocked off yeah. if you don't have that in place. So maybe boxing or martial arts or tango dancing may be an outstanding treatment for this. And it kind of retrains your brain to look at real cues really and move your body. To be attuned 
to see what the other person is doing and how you need to be in tune with the And that's the sort of thing that goes wrong when you're traumatized. Mm -hmm. So the study I've always wanted to do is comparing tango dancing <laughs> with cognitive behavioral treatment. I mean, that's what I do for a living. Yeah. I compare, I'm a scientist. Yeah. I see which one is better. I wonder about tango dancing. Well, see, I, that's one of the things I, I really like about your stuff is you, yeah. is you, you don't follow always a given line, that you're not afraid to say what if, what if, what if. You see, in my training was that it was a very selective training program at Harvard, and we were forbidden to read books during our first year. And we were told that you have only one teacher and that's your patience. And most textbooks are filled with nonsense. Yeah. And you can't trust what textbooks tell you. As it turns out, most textbooks are filled with nonsense, and so you see what your patients need. Mm -hmm. And then you write the textbook, which may also be filled with nonsense, <laughs> it's for somebody else to, <laughs> to judge. Uh, but, but the reality at the end is what is going on with this human right. being, and how can I help this human being to have a full and rich life? Well, that's it's not what science is supposed to be. It's about ob observing what's in front of you, listening and seeing and right. trying to make sense of it, not yeah trying to take another notion and put it on top of something. But what's surprising to me in our field is how religious people become. Mm -hmm. They find one form of treatment, which may be quite helpful for some people, right. and say, I have found the fountain of youth. I said, no, you have found something that makes people 10% better in 80% of the cases. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean I found a treatment of choice. I found something that is most of the time can help a little bit. Right. Like you were saying before, no one experiences an event in the same way. So right. what happens to the brain is not going to be identical right. by and definition. nobody benefits from the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and so you, re you need to do many different things. To, and that's what, the, what the clinical work is mm -hmm. about. Is that, so what can help this particular person to shift in a state of mm -hmm. focus and, and safety? For some people it's drugs, for other people right. it's yoga, for other people it's EMDR. Uh, and we don't know for sure. Well, I think in American society it likes answers that wrap up easily that would be particularly difficult and that's why medical treating with, with drugs is, a, is very attractive because it seems like yeah. it's a replicable thing. Uh, well see I'm a scientist I believe in replicable results but mm -hmm. I, I study and right. I look at statistics and see what works and what doesn't work but people don't like complex answers. I keep being impressed, like, oh, this is a <laughs> great treatment, and it looked, let me tell you that story, how great it was, and you go, like, okay, and how about the next person? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah. And what else? And what happens five years later? And right. And I think people have a hard time dealing with complexity. Mm -hmm. What people don't have trouble with dealing with complexity is in cancer patients. Why is that? Because everybody deals with cancer patients. It's a question of life and death, and you cannot blame people for mm -hmm. their cancer. But when it goes to kids who cannot learn in school and kids who are right. a pain in the ass, people want simple little answers. And they want them now. They want them now. And you want this kid to shut up and, and, and behave. Yeah. People aren't comfortable. It's, it's not comfortable for a lot of people to be around someone who isn't acting the way they expect them to act. On the other hand, a real school teacher, mm -hmm. of course, loves those challenges. Right and loves the complexity of a classroom. Mm -hmm. And a real clinician loves the complexity of a practice and to see that one size doesn't fit all. So to change the treatment yeah. of trauma, do we have to change the way? Trauma, as defined by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, is not just a psychological disorder or a set of symptoms. It is a complex and multifaceted experience that affects every aspect of a person's being. Dr. van der Kolk argues that trauma is not just a result of a specific event or series of events, but rather a disruption of the body's natural ability to regulate itself. According to Dr. van der Kolk, trauma is not just a mental health issue, but a physical one as well. He believes that trauma is stored in the body, and that traditional talk therapy is not always enough to address the deep-seated effects of trauma. Dr. van der Kolk argues that trauma therapy should involve a combination of traditional talk therapy, as well as body-based therapies such as yoga, meditation, and EMDR. Dr. van der Kolk also emphasizes the importance of understanding the role of the brain in trauma. He argues that trauma affects the brain in profound ways. 
altering the way it processes information and responds to stress. Dr. Van der Kolk believes that trauma therapy should focus on retraining the brain to respond to stress in a healthier way, rather than just addressing the symptoms of trauma. In addition to the physical and neurological aspects of trauma, Dr. Van der Kolk also highlights the importance of understanding the social and cultural factors that contribute to trauma. He argues that trauma is not just an individual experience, but a societal one as well. Dr. Van der Kolk believes that trauma therapy should address not only the individual's personal experiences of trauma, but also the larger societal factors that contribute to trauma, such as poverty, racism, and violence. Clinical practice works as well? I think there's a tradition that is gone, by and large. And that is when I trained, we need to try everything on ourselves. You know, and you know, mm -hmm. I was a very early psychopharmacologist. I did the first controlled studies on Prozac and Zoloft, and we took these things ourselves. You did? Yeah. And you see, how does it work on me? Oh, I wonder how it works similarly on other people. And so I went through psychoanalysis, and I had all these various treatments that I uh, recommend to people. Right. So you get a sense of, okay, this is how what it changes in me, and so now I can see, okay, this is this how it was helpful for me, this person is different from me and has much more right. trauma than I have, but this might just do it for people. But at the end, mm -hmm. you are an important intermediary person who has a sense of how this can shift your internal balance. What's that balance? It's all about balance, right? You know, I, the, in your book, you intentionally use the word body and mind together, and it's almost like a body, mind, it's a yeah. tango between the, between the body right. and mind sometimes. Well, you know, we, d we no longer do body-mind di dimorphism, actually. Mm -hmm. That is over. It, are you sure about that? Well, <laughs> other people do it, but we try not to do it. Uh, body-mind and, and, and brain are sort of all woven together mm -hmm. and just uh, smoke some dope and you know how everything <laughs> changes. Or, get drunk in the air, I think, chases, or, or break your foot mm -hmm. and go in crutches, and you know how everything changes. So everything affects everything else. Right. And, uh, that's how things are. And so, but, but, but we, what is very important is that what we really learned about trauma is that trauma is we experience in the form of heartbreak and mm -hmm. gut-wrenching sensations. And the trauma, it doesn't come out as a story, it comes out of feeling crazy and weird. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting that later on I discovered that Charles Darwin had written about it in his book, The Emotional Expression mm -hmm. of Animal Men, in 1872. He says, brain and body are closely connected with each other. And what comes very clear out of all the neuroscience studies mm -hmm. and Antonio Damasio studies and our work and the body work mm -hmm. is that trauma changes your relationship to your body. Your body is on constant alert, your body is frozen, mm -hmm. you cannot feel your body anymore, your body is not a live organ. Uh, and so when you look at a very large study, like the ACE study, where they look at the, right. uh, the consequences of trauma uh, in over 17,000 people, uh, the symptoms have to do with taking care of your own body. Uh, uh, mm. being able to regulate your body, mm -hmm. being able to calm yourself down, being able to limit your food intake, being able to protect your body by not wow. having unsafe sex, by not smoking, mm -hmm. by not blowing up uh, with food. And it has to all to do with uh, how, how you live inside of your body. And so the body has become a very central issue for mm. most people who really understand. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals was published in 1872, a year after the Descent of Man. Originally intended as a chapter in Descent, it grew too long and required a book of its own. I have adopted Darwin's practice of referring to his books by a single word from the title. Darwin started writing Expression two days after correcting the page proofs for Descent, finishing it in four months just before he compiled the sixth and last edition of On the Origin of Species. Many of the central ideas, although not the details, appear in his 1838-1839 to notebooks. Prior to expression, 
The face was of interest primarily to those who claimed they could read personality or intelligence from the facial features. Darwin ignored the features and focused on the visible but temporary changes in appearance. It is without doubt a brilliant book, forecasting many of the fundamentals of not just facial expression, but emotion itself. Expression is the first pioneering study of emotion, and in my view should be considered the book that began the science of psychology. Darwin treated the emotions as separate discrete entities or modules, such as anger, fear, disgust, etc. The German physician Wilhelm Wundt proposed an alternative view of emotion about a decade later. So trauma changes your own relationship with your body. Yep. So you're out there looking for, th for threats or maybe trying to make sense of the world around you because you've, your mind's responding to this trauma and at the same time it doesn't free your body to do the things it needs to do to take care well, of itself? Well, that's that, but there's another thing. And that is your body feels so messed up mm -hmm. that it's scary to feel yourself. And mm -hmm. so you would rather think about there's awful things out there and talk about those awful things out there than have the courage to go inside and meet all the mm -hmm. demons that are living inside of you. And that's a very important part yeah. of trauma treatment is that you need to feel those feelings that are inside of you. Has, do you think everyone has experienced trauma? No. People have experienced bad experiences. Uh, no. We have not all been molested, mm -hmm. raped, or beaten up by our caregivers. Mm -hmm. No. We have, most of us have not seen our best friends being blown away in front of us. No. So where is but the, many people have. Yeah. I and mean, where is that line between, you know, like you're saying, no two people experience the same thing yeah. the same. So where does it, for one person, become trauma and the other become a really horrible experience yeah. I have to deal with? Well, you know, trauma is, over, is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so your brain and your mind gets overwhelmed by certain experiences. And what that might be has a lot to do with the system that catches you. So mm -hmm. as long as you have parents, spouses, loved ones right. who say, my God, let me hold me, you, let me take care of you, right. people by and large do okay. So the very first study I did with Vietnam veterans was that what we found is that the trauma was a sequence of events. These guys were very good at what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And they were very well trained and they loved what they were doing. And then one of their friends got killed and they went into a rage. Because when your best mm -hmm. friend gets blown up by some other guy, you cannot help but right. becoming enraged. And then they started to do things that were horrifying. They started to kill people randomly. And that combination of seeing this horrendous thing, of seeing your friend blown right. up, and then doing things after which you cannot innocently go home, that was for, for them the biggest yeah. trauma. And to some degree that's true also for kids who get traumatized, is that it's not what happens, but how it is received. So if your mom or your dad or your teacher I mean, comes up and say, oh, that's so horrible, let me take care of you, right. You don't blame yourself. But if there's nobody there for you, you start thinking, it is my fault. Okay. This happened to me because I have a bad, I'm a bad person, or because I was not alert, or because I deserved it. And so that, that context in which it occurs it is tremendously important. Well, I hate to say this, because I'm really enjoying this conversation, but we are out of time. <laughs> Already? <laughs> Already, I can't believe it. Okay. Um, but this has been a really terrific I mean, I've learned an enormous mm. amount, and I thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you.